Greetings from Columbia Business School Executive Education. I'm Scott Gardner, and I'm here today with Professor Stan Van Neuroberg for today's webinar, Flattening the Curve, Pandemic-Induced Revaluation of Urban Real Estate. Before I introduce Professor, I'd like to just go over a few quick logistics. As you'll see on this next slide, a recording of this webinar will be made available to you. If you'd like to tweet about the webinar, please do so at hashtag CBSExecEd. And finally, please submit those questions to the Q&A box. We'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Nuremberg. He is the Professor of Finance at Columbia Business School and the co-faculty director of the upcoming Executive Education Real Estate Investing Program. His research lies at the intersection of housing, asset pricing, and macroeconomics. He has served as an advisor to the Norwegian Minister of Finance and his research has appeared in publications including the Journal of Political Economy and the American Economic Review and many more. He is also the faculty research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and at the Center for European Policy Research. Professor Van Nuremberg, it's very nice to be with you today. I shall leave the stage and rejoin you for the Q&A in the last 10 minutes. Thank you, Scott, and thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, to tell you a little bit more about some recent research that I, I have been doing in the wake of the COVID pandemic and how it has affected real estate markets, but a particular focus today on the residential real estate market. So this is based on a working paper, which is available publicly uh, together with co-authors Arpit Gupta, Vrinda Mittal, and Jonas Peters. So as we all know, the last year has been unprecedented in so many different ways, uh, but it has also been an unprecedented year for America's housing markets. Uh, and in particular, what we saw is this great migration out of the urban centers of a lot of our metropolitan areas, a boom in suburban housing markets. And uh, you know, the question is how will all of this uh, you know, play out and how will this uh, kind of, as we start to exit the COVID pandemic, how will all of this uh, potentially reverse, potentially uh, potentially continue. So this is going to be the topic of, of uh, today's talk. And you know the key object in my in my talk today will be uh, this relationship between house prices or house rents and how far the particular house, if you like, is from the city center. And in urban economics, one of the key concepts is this concept called a bit rent bit rent function. And the bit rent function basically describes the relationship between the rent or the price of the house and the distance from the center of the city. And typically before the pandemic, we think of houses as being much more expensive close to the city center than they are farther away in the suburbs. And there are multiple good reasons for that. You know, the first one is if you live close to the city center, chances are you're not commuting to your job. Most people don't like to commute. And so that gets reflected in higher rents or higher house prices close to the city center. Second, urban cores tend to have much better urban amenities. There's opera, there's restaurants, there's lots of friends nearby, and that too gets impounded in the rent and impounded in the price. Um, and so for all of these reasons, typically prices and rents tend to be much higher in the city center. And as you move farther and farther away from the city center, you know, those prices and those rents come back down. And so that, that relationship is called the bit rent function and it tends to be downward sloping. What we are going to show in, in our paper today is that the COVID pandemic has kind of fundamentally upended that relationship. And in particular, that urban land gradient or that urban price gradient, uh, that urban price premium that we saw before the pandemic basically evaporated. In other words, you know, the, the cost of housing is now basically the same in the suburbs as it was in the urban centers. And so that's quite a dramatic change uh, it's, you know, an, you know, to one of the most important asset markets in the United States. And so we want to understand this a little bit better. Okay, so we're first going to document this change, both in prices and in rents. And then we're going to try to understand it a little bit better. And one of the ways in which we will tackle this question is to look in, you know, across metropolitan areas. And the basic idea is simple. There's a lot of variation in how much of this phenomenon occurred in different parts of the country. And so maybe from that variation, we can learn something about the deeper economic mechanisms that underlie uh, the drivers of that, uh, of that change. Okay. And then the, you know, the last thing we will do is we'll try to basically back out what housing markets are telling us about the future, right? So we would all like to know how will all of this play out kind of in 2021, the balance of 2021 and going forward. And so what we're going to conclude from that exercise is that you know, COVID was a massive temporary shock, 
but it does not appear to herald a permanent demise of the of the city of the superstar city. In other words, you know, our model is going to be predicting a reversal of some of these uh, changes, and in particular, we're going to predict that urban rent is going to grow faster going forward uh, in you know than suburban rent, and so we'll see a partial revival, an urban revival, if you if you like, um, you know, once once COVID uh, you know gets into the rearview mirror. Okay, so that's the plan for today. So now let me kind of give you a little bit more detail on each of these pieces, right? So the first thing we document in the paper is patterns of urban migration, right? So we all know anecdotally that when COVID hit in March 2020, a lot of people left the, you know, the large cities. And uh, we document this using some unique data from uh, cell phone data. You know, whether you like it or not, a lot of your cell phone data is actually being tracked and it allows data vendors to basically track your mobility. And so we got access to um, one such data set from Venpath and Venpath basically tracks cell phone devices over time and where they are located. And so from that, we can basically do a census, a population count of how many cell phone devices are you know, present in each location. And then we can look at the change in that over time. And so what this graph shows you is between February and June, 2020, uh, you know, where do people go? And so we're looking here at changes in population and each little cross here in the graph is a zip code, okay? And so basically what we're, and then we're plotting those changes in population against the distance from the city center, okay? And so for each zip code, kind of as you read from the left to the right in this graph, you're going from the urban core all the way to the suburbs, right? So here are the suburbs, here is the urban core, you know, close to the city center. And basically what we see is that they were, you know, declines in population, population outflows uh, close to the city center, and there were population increases farther away from the city center, right? So that kind of suggests that the population is migrating from the urban core uh, towards the suburbs, right? So that's observation number one. Um, by the way, you don't only see this in cell phone data, you also see this in, you know, U.S. postal change of address requests, right? So the U.S. Postal Service, you know, uh, asks people to, you know, when they want to set up mail forwarding to a new address, you know, keeps track of that. And so you can use that as your indicator of where people are. And this graph shows out migration rate. So basically people leaving, um, again, as a function of the distance from the city center. This is for New York City. And basically what we see is the closer you are to the city center, the more likely you are to out migrate over this period in 2020, in the first, in the, you know, from March to October, 2020. And the farther you are away from the city center in the suburbs, basically there's less out migration, there's more in migration. So the population is actually growing in those suburban places, okay? And then the last piece on the mobility side that I wanna leave you with is uh, the relationship between these changes in the population and this working from home. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about working from home, so let me be clear what I mean here. So the working from home score is a score that is measured before the pandemic, and it basically asks, you know, to what extent can your job be done from home? And every job gets a working from home score. Can it be done from home, yes or no? And so then we can aggregate this up across all the jobs in a given location, right? And so some zip codes have a lot of jobs that can be done remotely. Those zip codes would be on the right of this graph, something like 70% of the jobs could be done remotely. And in other places, that's only 20%, okay? And so there's a lot of variation in the United States and just how much job remote work can be done. And so now what we find is that, you know, there's this strong association between you know, changes in population and working from home. Basically the places where people could do their job from home is the places where people left. Those are the places that saw declines in population. And again, this makes a lot of sense anecdotally, but it's nice to see this hold up so strongly in the data. So next we turn to our main finding, which is to study house prices and rents, the residential rents, uh, again, in relationship to how far away uh, your zip code is from the, from the center. And so you can first see this kind of in a in graphical format, right? So here is the New York metropolitan area. Um, and what I'm plotting here on the left picture is changes in house prices between December 2019 and December 2020. And dark green means prices go up a lot. Red means prices go down a lot. And just kind of visually, you can already see that house prices are indeed growing much faster, farther away from Manhattan. Here is Manhattan in the middle. The middle panel here, we're zooming in on Manhattan. You see a lot of red, a lot of house price declines. Uh, you know, in the urban core in Manhattan, and you see strong price growth, uh, you know, in the, in, in the suburbs. In the right picture, we're showing rents, changes in rent over the same period. And again, you see a lot of dark red in Manhattan, rents are going down, 
uh, you see green, rents are going up in the suburbs. So we, I can show this a little more uh, formally by plotting rent levels against the distance from the city center. And the green line here is the situation before COVID in December, 2019. And what you see before COVID is that, you know, rents are typically higher close to, this, or close to the urban core. That's that urban rent premium I was talking about before. And then rents are declining as you move farther and farther away from the city center. Now that relationship, that bid rent function flattened during the pandemic. Hence the title of the paper, flattening the curve. This is the curve that we are flattening here. It's the bid rent function. It used to be pretty steep. Now it's become pretty flat. In other words, rents have fallen near the urban core and rents have risen uh, farther away in the suburbs. Another way to see this is to look at rent changes. Basically, instead of looking at the rent levels, uh, look at the changes between December 2019 and December 2020. And what you see here very strongly is that close to the urban core, rents are falling something like 15%, whereas farther away into the suburbs, rents are rising strongly, okay? This is a picture for New York. You see the same picture in San Francisco, maybe even more dramatic. You see this flattening of the curve or in terms of changes, strong, house, strong rent growth in the suburbs, uh, strong rent declines in the urban core. And you can do this for all 30 of the largest metropolitan areas in the United States. And again, let's just focus on the right panel here. These are all the zip codes. You know, this covers about 80% of the US population. And you basically find the same pattern, you know, rental declines near the urban core uh, of all those MSAs and uh, rent growth, strong rent growth um, in the suburbs. So we can now formalize this, this changing gradient, right? This change, this is a gradient change. The gradient of this line is flattening, it's changing, it's declining. We can formalize this by looking uh, at a relationship between rents and distance from the city center. And we can look at that relationship each month. And so each dot here is before the pandemic. What is that relationship? You see that slope of that line, that rent gradient is negative. That's a downward sloping line a negative gradient, right? And now if you look at what's happening after the pandemic, you see that this gradient basically starts to go towards zero. And in fact, in December, 2020, it just about exactly hit zero. So there's a large increase in this rent gradient. And basically what zero means is that there's no more urban rent premium. Urban rents are now essentially equal to uh, in the suburbs as they are in, in the urban core. So all the premium for urban living has essentially evaporated at the end of December, 2020. So this is a pretty stark result and it's the main result in our paper. Now we can turn to prices. So we were looking at housing rents before. Now let's look at housing prices, owner occupied house prices. And essentially you find the same phenomenon. You see a flattening of the curve, which means that prices are you know, growing much less in the urban core than in the suburbs. The changes are upward sloping in distance from the city center. You see this for New York, you see this also for San Francisco very strongly, and you see it for all 30 metropolitan areas, right? So you see again, you know, strong price growth in the suburbs, uh, weak price growth in the urban core. Now in some places like in San Francisco, house prices were actually falling in the urban core. But, you know, that's also true in New York. It's not true on average in the, in the average 30 MSAs. Now, part of what's happening here is that interest rates, for example, were very low uh, in the, over the course of uh, 2020, which meant that mortgage financing was very cheap. And so that boosted house prices everywhere, including in the urban core. But still, we see a clear relationship uh, with distance where price, even if there's price growth, it's much weaker in the urban core as it is in the suburbs. And so we can revisit our uh, price gradient changes month by month. And you see a similar phenomenon where, you know, there is a strong negative slope before the pandemic. And that slope becomes a little bit less negative during the pandemic. This price change, the change in the price gradient is not nearly as strong as it was for rents. Um, and so that's actually a very informative observation. The fact that housing prices change in the same direction as rents, but not nearly as strongly. And that's gonna tell, that's gonna teach us something about how permanent these changes are. Because if you think of prices, prices essentially capitalize all the future rents, right? And so prices in some sense tell us something not only about today's rents, but also about future rents. And the fact that these changes in prices are not as strong as the changes in rents, tells us that potentially there will be a reversal of these patterns in rents going forward. Okay, and I'll, I'll flesh that out in more detail as we go through this. I also wanna briefly show you what's happening to, uh, to some quantity data. So some active listings, uh, you know, here you see listings of houses for sale, uh, changes in listings. So there are a lot more houses for sale in the urban core because houses weren't getting sold. 
and there are a lot fewer listings for sale in the suburbs. Similarly, uh, houses lingered on the market longer in the urban core, uh, they, they went quickly in the suburbs. And all of these things are obviously correlated with, um, you know, with, um, with uh, the price changes that, that I documented. Okay. So let's quickly go back here. Okay, so having shown that, let me now turn to the cross-sectional analysis, right? So now the question is, what are the patterns driving these changes? And um, we're gonna look at the cross-section of 30 metropolitan areas. Uh, these are the 30 largest MSAs. And what I'm showing you here is the, Nash, is the change in the rent gradient in each of these metropolitan areas, okay? And so you can see it was very strong in New York, very strong, dark green means you know, big changes. Uh, big increases in the rent gradient in San Francisco as well, but there's some variation across these metropolitan areas. The same is true for the price gradient. Uh, there's a lot of variation. And we're gonna try to use this variation to try to learn what are the economic forces underlying these changes in, uh, in the urban versus suburban housing markets. And so we kind of have three candidate explanations for these changes. And we're gonna run a horse race between these three explanations. Our first explanation is that it's all about working from home. The fact that people could now work from, from anywhere, wouldn't have to commute to their job, is what prompted them to leave, is in, and it's what prompted the strength in the rental market in the suburbs and the weakness of the rental market in the urban core. So that's kind of what this first column indicates. It indicates a very strong positive correlation across these MSAs. The more work from home there is in your MSA, the stronger the change in that rent gradient was, and that force alone can explain something like 30% of the variation across MSAs in this uh, change in rent gradient. Now, a second candidate explanation is that it was all about COVID measures and the government. And, and so we know that the government had a lot of stringency measures that you know, basically people couldn't leave home. There were business closures and so forth, but there was a lot of variation again across metropolitan areas in how strict these COVID restrictions were. And so again, we can ask, you know, is there an association between the strictness of these COVID measures and the change in the rent gradient? And indeed, we find that there is. Uh, that explains about 20% of the variation. And then finally, we study to what extent the housing supply elasticity, which varies also a lot across these areas, is associated with this change. And here we find much less of a result. When we run a horse race, it's really the working from home that comes out the winner out of, uh, out of this race. And so the way we, so the way we interpret this is very much Kind of a commuting force, the fact that you don't have to commute, it's not so much about the urban amenities, because the urban amenities, you know, they were shut down and, you know, that should be picked up by the stringency measure. Uh, it's really more about the commuting, the working from home that is driving these changes. We find the same thing when we try to explain cross sectional variation in the price gradient changes, okay? And we find the same thing when we turn to the zip code level instead of the metropolitan area level. One nice thing about this zip code area analysis is that we can do a much better job uh, essentially measuring amenities at the, at the local level. In particular, we have this measure for the number of restaurants and bars that was open uh, during COVID or close during COVID uh, as our proxy for the urban amenities that were available to people of those locations. And in fact, you know, even though we find an association, uh, you know, we still find that the working from home force is by far the strongest, okay? Now, finally, let me point one thing out. Um, you know, again, the changes in, 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 in working, the effect of working from home is much stronger for rents as it is for prices, which again, tells us something about potentially the permanency of these effects. And so that's the last thing I wanna tell you about a little bit, which is what do these data, what do housing markets tell us about, you know, how long this COVID shock will last? And so we're gonna use a simple valuation model, uh, which is sometimes known as the Campbell-Shiller present value model, in order to ask ourselves, you know, what do housing markets, prices and rents combined teach us about what the market, what the housing market expects rent growth to be in the future? Okay, so we're gonna back out the market's current belief about future rent growth from essentially the prices and the rents, the price to rent ratio to be precise, as well as potentially changes in risk premium. Okay, so basically these price changes and these rent changes is something we observe in the data before and after COVID in urban and in suburban zip codes. We're gonna be making an assumption on risk premia uh, in those locations. And that's gonna give us essentially a forecast of what a rental growth will be. And if you believe that the pandemic will eventually completely uh, go away, maybe it will take 20 years, but eventually it will be a fully transitory phenomenon then what our model tells us is that urban rent growth will be four and a half percent higher 
than suburban rent growth in 2021. So it'll be three and a half percent higher in 2022 and so forth, and then gradually come back down to its long run average. If you believe that the pandemic is permanent, that we will never go back to the world before the pandemic, then this change is also positive. We also expect an urban revival in rent growth, but we expect it to be permanent now. Now, probably the truth is somewhere in between. In fact, we use survey data from Pulsenomics, which queries a bunch of housing market experts and asks them in February, 2021, do you think the pandemic will be transitory or permanent? 64% of these experts say it will be a transitory phenomenon. 34, 36% say it will be permanent. So we can use that probability or that frequency to basically to come up with a weighted average. And so that's the orange line here. And basically now what you see is, you know, urban rent revival, urban rent growth in 2021, about three and a half percent higher than in the suburbs, you know, mean reverting, but not all the way mean reverting to the pre-pandemic because now we have partially a permanent effect. Okay, and so the idea here is that working from home is going to have some permanent impact. We already know there's a lot of companies that have already announced that they will be working from home and that some employees can choose to work from home permanently. Some of them will, most of them arguably will revert to some sort of hybrid work environment. And, you know, from that perspective, it doesn't seem so, to, so strange to, to think that there will be some, uh, you know, some lingering, some permanent effects. So let me conclude. Uh, the pandemic triggered an urban flight that benefited the suburban real estate sector and hurt the urban core during 2020. Work from home opportunities explain much of that disappearance of the urban rent premium. House prices and rents suggest that much, but not all of the working from home phenomenon is expected to be transitory. So we are, we are predicting an urban rent revival, but not necessarily a complete revival to the pre-pandemic state. And then obviously how all of this plays out will affect housing affordability, right? Because in, in the suburbs are in general cheaper to live in than the urban core. So, you know, this, this migration has potentially been a good one, a good thing for a housing affordability. It also affects the fiscal health of our superstar cities. And of course, it also affects commercial real estate. And so we've begun to do some work on commercial real estate. Uh, you know, you can see some re returns here on the left panel where you saw the office sector getting clobbered. Uh, industrial relative to the industrial real estate sector, which has done quite well. And on the right panel, you can see what has been happening to new office leases signed uh, in, in a bunch of office submarkets, again, relative to how much working from home there is in these submarkets. And you see the places like New York and San Francisco that have a lot of working from home. Those are the office markets that have seen a, a, a decline in new leasing activity over the past year uh, compared to those areas that had much less working from home. So uh, Scott, let me stop here and uh, turn it over back to you. Thank you very much, Professor. This, this falls under the heading of like very timely information for people and I'm, there's a lot of interest here. A lot of great questions came in. So let me just start off by saying one of the questions that came in a lot, so I'm just sort of combining a lot of people asking was really about, uh, you know, just your insights, general insights on the real estate for New York City, the metropolitan area, and you know the the New York strategy for landlord recovery that that seemed to be on a lot of people's mind, and I'm you know they're basing it on the New York reality now. Do you have any I, uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think this is a great question. I think it's the the million dollar question. I mean, uh, on the one hand, right, we've seen a uh, very low office occupancy in the last uh, several months, even today. You know, very few workers have actually returned to the office space. This obviously has landlords very worried. It has city planners very worried that you know the decline in urban uh, Commercial real estate valuations will ultimately erode property, the property tax base, that this might potentially trigger additional migration out of New York, you know, further deepening the fiscal hole. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I would say there is a countervailing force here. And the countervailing force, in my view, is that in New York, New York, the New York City and the New York metropolitan area more, more broadly has in some sense always been too small. And the reason it has been too small is because housing was so unaffordable in New York. So you know, before the pandemic, we were missing out on a bunch of young, talented people that would have come if it had not been for the very high house prices. Now, with working from home or some hybrid working model, you could imagine a future where those jobs will actually come to New York now, based on the premise that the, the workers could live in the suburbs and come in maybe two days per week into the Manhattan headquarters, and housing is you know, arguably substantially more affordable in the suburbs than it is in the urban core. And so this could be a countervailing force. And how all of this plays out, I think is, you know, anybody's guess. I don't have a crystal ball, 
I do think that um, you know, that's potentially an interesting force that could ultimately and in the long run strengthen the New York metropolitan area. Yeah, you know, on, uh, while we're on that question, uh, you brought up a point. I'm looking at the questions that came in. Nicholas asked, so with that being said for New York, what are your thoughts about maybe the second tier cities that are they gonna see a boom of, of people relocating to less, you know, not New York, not San Francisco, not, but the other cities and will there be a revitalization maybe of a city like Detroit or Charlotte or something? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we certainly saw during the pandemic that there was, you know, quite a bit of migration out of the superstar metropolitan areas like San Francisco and New York towards those second tier cities. You know, some cities you hear mentioned a lot are Boise, Idaho, or, you know, Lake Tahoe, or Austin, Texas. Um, you know, a lot of New Yorkers presumably migrated to, to Florida. Now it looks like a lot of that might, so I, I, I should mention that even though that has received a lot of media coverage, the numbers are actually very small. These type of interstate migration rates are actually very low. And some of it was a seasonal. A lot of Floridians have meanwhile returned to New York. As soon as the summer hit in Florida, they all came back to, to the Northeast. And, and so I think we can over we can over uh, do kind of these, these type of speculations. Um, you know, that said, cities like San Jose, Austin, Charlotte have done very well in the last in the last uh, year or so. Their commercial real estate markets are strong and, and, and increasingly so. So there's certainly a sense that. Uh, you know, those second tier cities, some of them are doing well. Uh, I don't think Detroit is doing particularly well. I don't think Pittsburgh is doing particularly well. So there's a lot of variation there, but there's definitely strength in, in some of these cities, especially in the South, especially in the, in the Southeast. And I wonder if it's, it could be categorized into age groups. You know, I mean, like, obviously, like that migration of age groups to certain cities, you know, and Absolutely, right? It's both job availability and demographics. I think, you know, Austin, for example, saw the highest population growth of any of these second tier cities. It's a lot of tech workers, younger tech workers that move there. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's a combination of demographics, a lot of the baby boomers, sorry, a lot of the Gen Xers are coming of uh, home ownership age, and some of them want to own a home. And that's if that's out of reach in the, in the, in the superstar cities. That will, I think, naturally drive them to, to some of these uh, smaller, somewhat more affordable cities. Right. Okay, great. So let's move on to another topic. Uh, Frederico asks, have different, or how have different markets, for example, Europe, the Middle East, Asia, reacted differently, say, than the United States? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say that a lot of the, the superstar cities uh, across the world actually had fairly similar reactions. Uh, you know, one example that comes to my mind is London. Right, so London had a very similar suburban flight during the height of COVID. It had similar issues with office occupancy, and it now is seeing a similar rebound uh, or partial rebound um, to, to the US. I certainly think that Asian markets are quite different. I think those are probably the most different from New York. I think part of it is that folks in Asia tend to live in, in, in even denser urban environments than what we're used to in, in the US. And so they have even less space at home. And so they're even more eager to return to, to the office. Uh, and they have a very strong office culture. And so um, office occupancy, and they also had less COVID on top of it, right? If you think about uh, COVID containment has generally been, been more successful in, in Asia. And so there, I think you see a stronger rebound uh, in the office sector in particular than what we have seen uh, in the U.S. and in Western Europe, but I would say, by and large, the experience has been has been fairly similar. It's been a global experience. All right, uh, it's twelve o'clock, but with your permission, I would love to. There's a lot of great questions. If I could ask you for maybe three, four, or five more minutes of your time, Happy to do so. Wonderful. So the next question that came in, John asked, "Do you think retail and restaurant services will be affected by with this population flow information?" Do you anticipate that there will be changes in their locations? I mean, we, as people who live in New York, we've certainly seen the retail, you know, being affected by this. What do you see going forward? No doubt about it, right? So the retail and the office, I think of it as an ecosystem and you disrupt part of the ecosystem, you disrupt the entire ecosystem. And so there is no doubt that the retail around the mid uh, midtown, around, you know, fi the financial district, around these central business districts has been severely disrupted. And, um, you know, some of it, you know, New York City has seen one third restaurant closure. Some of these restaurants will not reopen. And of course, if everybody comes back, some new restaurants will come into their place. Uh, but if people don't come back, a lot of that retail will not come back. I, at the same time, I do think that 
the retail jobs will migrate just like the people and there will be more suburban restaurants, there will be uh, more suburban shopping than, than there was. Um, so I think in general, we've also seen this in the office sector actually, suburban office has been quite, uh, has had quite strong uh, volumes in the past year, sales volumes of suburban office space has seen stronger price growth of suburban office uh, than urban office. And so I think we see this, we see this across property, uh, across uh, property uh, types. Yeah, I, I see a lot of, in the region that I partially and sometimes a lot of ur uh, business kind of, in, you know, industrial complexes out in the country, you know, that are, they're empty right now, but I wonder if they'll have a renaissance, people who want to stay out here, but still need space. Yeah, and some of that is happening. Some of that is happening. Some uh, some mall conversions into uh, you know into other other uses that are kind of more conducive to the new the new demographics of the area. Right. Right. All right. One other question uh, from Jorge says: Does how does climate change play into all of this? This is a great question. I like that question. I think um, my view on this is that the most sustainable way for humanity to live. Uh, from a carbon footprint perspective is in dense urban environments where uh, reliance on cars is just much, much lower. We can use public transportation. We use less floor space. We use less heating. And so from that perspective, I think this, co this, or this suburban flight under COVID is, is a step back, right? Um, in the sense that it's just not the best uh, carbon, from a carbon footprint perspective, the most uh, eco-friendly way to live. Now, these things may change in the future as, as potentially public transportation adjusts to that as potentially driverless cars or electric cars become more prevalent. But I think in the short run, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a climate negative. Right. Uh, okay. So I would, one last question and then we'll, I'll take sort of a, a final question from me. So this is Sonia. This, can you talk about how this has impacted municipal housing? Um, I assume that she means uh, affordable housing, maybe government um, government owned affordable housing, yes. um, right? So I think in general, because of urban the urban decline in urban rents, in some sense, the just uh, even the the market the, the rent the market rent has come down in these places. So that has made the urban core more affordable relative to what it was before. Of course, in many of these places, that's still not affordable housing by any stretch of the imagination. So as a result, we're kind of relying to a large extent on governmental subsidies to provide affordable housing in the US. Uh, a lot of that is coming from municipal governments and, um, and a lot of these budgets have been very tight because of COVID. Now, I think the government, the federal government bailouts that we've seen have actually been you know, quite generous to the, to the states and local municipalities. And I think they have averted a crisis. Uh, you know, that said, um, I think, there's no doubt that municipal budgets are under strain, uh, will continue to do so, and that that's, and I think on net, not, not really good news uh, for affordable housing. You know, there are some bright spots, like in New York, for example, there was some money made available to convert hotel space into affordable housing. So that was a creative idea, you know, to the extent that we have too much hotel space and too little affordable housing, that seems to make sense. That conversion costs money. And so maybe if the government helps with that conversion that creates, that's a win-win that creates affordable housing that creates a better use of this space. Great. All right, we have about a minute left. And I, I always, every time I host the webinars, I like to ask the professors I'm with, basically, you know, when you, when they take this information for the people that are with us today, for the people that will watch the video, in terms of real estate for themselves, real estate for their businesses and thinking what next, what are two or three things they should think about today? And what are some resources going forward that will help them to think about those things? Yeah, so I think real estate touches everybody. You know, we, we work in, in certain buildings, we live in other buildings. And so when, you know, when we think of real estate, I think in general, as a, from a personal investment perspective, it, real estate is a wealth building asset, right? So, uh, you know, home ownership is something that has over the generations generated you know, substantial positive returns. So it's definitely something to think about when it comes to this decision of owning versus renting. That's a decision that many, many people are, are facing. Uh, you know, in terms of locations, I think the big takeaway from the COVID pandemic is that there will be a, a less tight association between where you live and where you work, because there will now in the future be places where you can work in one city and live in another one and hardly ever have to commute. And that frees people up. It frees them up spatially. Where do they live? Where do they want to live? What kind of things do they enjoy doing? Some people enjoy urban amenities. Other people enjoy hiking in the Rocky Mountains. And, and basically now 
we might get a better match between what you like to do, where you like to live and where you like to work. And these things don't have to essentially trade off as much anymore as they used in the past. And so that's something else that I think is a big takeaway from, from COVID and something that's gonna change our lives, I think very fundamentally and arguably very positively. Great, thank you so much. Such great information. We'll be sharing this with all the participants, the slides and also this uh, recording. Uh, Professor Van Nuremberg, it was wonderful to work with you today. And to all of you on behalf of Columbia Executive Education, myself and Professor Van Nuremberg, we wish you a healthy and safe day.